our biggest month in company history ever. In this episode, my COO Corey and I talk about how we did a $390,000 month and how you can start doing multiple six-figure months too. We cover everything from sales, marketing, what lead channels are working, including our real-time numbers of how we did a $390,000 month. You won't want to miss it. Stay tuned. We just had our biggest month of revenue ever in the business. How much did we make, Corey? Just over $390,000. $390,000 in one month. Mm-hmm. What? Yep. Really? Yeah. How? A lot of work. <laughs> A lot of work. So let's talk about this because I really want to make sure the audience understands the steps needed to get to this point. Because if you're listening to this, and I remember like when I was starting out, or $390,000 in a year would change my life. Oh, yeah. $390,000 in one month? Are you kidding me? Is that even possible? We're in, Wait, we're in Boise, Idaho. It's like less than a million people, and it's a super competitive market, and my market's too saturated, and you can do $390,000 in one month? What? Mm-hmm. So let's break that down. Of that $390,000... In the month of May, we had 64% of that come from outbound channels. Which are what? Cold calling and texting. Mm. 64% of that number, so roughly 250-ish? Yeah. 250K of that from outbound channels. And then the remaining from inbound, plus we had a couple JVs and and referral deals. Our average deal size, $49,000 on outbound. So for all of you that are saying, oh, texting is dead, it's illegal, or it doesn't work anymore, and cold calling's too hard, cold calling sucks, I hate rejection. Okay, well, we're still getting almost $50,000 per deal with it, right? Contrast that with inbound, which is is kind of crazy, was a $27,000 average deal size. Now, most of the time, it's the opposite, but I think it's really important. We were talking to our team about this in our all hands this morning. Outbound works and our sales guys, they favor inbound leads and I get it. They are raising their hand. They're seeking us out. They have a problem. They are more motivated, right? But Mm -hmm. outbound still works and we need to pay attention to it. What else? The other big thing is, were these all wholesales or is there a mixture of how we got the revenue in? Good question. A majority of them are wholesales or innovations. Yes. Yes. Got it. Why is that? Well, the big reason is because Novations give us the chance to go to the broader market. Right? Yeah. It lets us go to the biggest buyers list out there. And so we can compete, especially with people who may not know how to do Novations, by outbidding them. And at least one or two of these, we actually had competition on because they filled out maybe multiple web forms. And they met with other investors. And we were able to outbid them because we were able to pitch Novation appropriately. Yeah. So we had 12 deals that closed. Mm-hmm. And of those, eight were Novations. Eight. That's a lot. Yeah. So just short of seven out of 10, which is right in line with what we're seeing right now and what we're all the number of deals that we're doing in the business, right? Mm -hmm. Seven out of 10 are novations because owner occupants will pay more than investors. Yeah. And one of those, I think it was actually our biggest deal on this list was because it was a novation and it was such a good novation. We just said, we're just going to take it down with hard money and we can still make way more money doing that, even though it's going to take a little longer to benefit. Love that. So we essentially closed on it, relisted it, and then within 45 days or so realized mm-hmm. that revenue. Yep. Amazing. So how do we, because not every month is, is like this for us, right? This is an anomaly. This, there's a reason why not this yet. is. Not yet. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Not yet. But what would it take to have every month be almost 400K, right? So let's dive into that. What was the main driver of why we had so many contracts close? in the month of May and why our deal size was so big in the month of May. The biggest reason is the amount of work that was put in from the entire team from December through March. Why? Because those are the months that one, we had a a massive level of action, urgency, and because there's a time delay, we talked about seven or eight out of 12 being novations. It takes a while to get a property ready for photos, get it on the market, find an end buyer who's going to close 30 to 45 days later. So there's a time delay and there's a lag between when you put in the effort to make that call, go on that appointment, get that under contract, and when the revenue is realized. And so when we look at how this distribution broke out, 
and I'll just go through by the numbers, 135,000 of what closed in May was put under contract in December of last year. So one more time. So we did $390,000 in May, and you're saying 135 of that was from contracts that we inked in December. In December of 2023. Five months ago. Yeah. So everyone, like, I, I've done this. Like, you put something under contract, and you're like, woohoo, I won. And then you sit around, and you wait for the revenue to come in. And it can mm. be really disheartening because it hasn't hit the bank account yet. Am I doing something wrong? Is this we even work? Right. And this is the, the double-edged sword with running an off-market deal-finding machine, which is exactly what we teach in the Real Freedom Program, is – Wholesales are your quick cash, right? That's how you keep the wheels turning, your marketing budget going, making your payroll, making sure that you're getting your basic living expenses met. You can close a deal in as fast as three days with a wholesale, right? Mm -hmm. With Novations, it's completely the opposite. <laughs> so your cash conversion cycles are way longer. You have to be able to have cash flow in the meantime to be able to stomach those 60, 90, five-month closing mm -hmm. time frames because yes an owner occupant will pay more but there's a cost to that it's time yeah and so you might ask like well shouldn't we just wholesale these if it's going to take three to six months to get your money back generally these may not even pencil as a wholesale or if they are they're five grand and so the, it, it just doesn't even make sense to go through that time and that effort to make that little money if you don't even know if it's going to execute yeah let's actually this is such a good point i'm glad we got into this the ideal operating framework for a business, right, is to be able to maximize the amount of dollars that you make on every single deal, right? If you have low cash in the bank, you're going to have to be going for that quick buck more frequently instead of maximizing. I just got to get money in the bank. Give me the 20K. Whereas, well, if I don't need the money now and I can novate it, maybe I can make 35 or 40, right? So a lot of this is building up cash reserves in the bank to be able to be okay with these longer cash conversion cycles. And we've been through so many peaks and valleys with this. We've been in those low points where it's like, oh crap, we don't have cash in the bank. We got to make payroll. Like some of our best deals, we just got a wholesale. We need cash now, you know? And there's nothing wrong with that at all. Mm -hmm. But you have to like the ideal scenario of why we had this monster month is because we could optimize every deal, right? And so we had a deal that we double closed on that we took down that we made 99000 on, right, this month. Mm -hmm. We could have wholesaled that and made, what, 40 Maybe. Yeah, maybe 35 40 on yeah. it. Okay. That's a huge swing. That's $50,000 different just from having cash reserves in my bank account and all my expenses covered for the next 60 to 90 days while that gets closed, cleaned up, and relisted. So... On the flip side, though, you don't want to do every single deal like that because then you won't have cash coming in. So there's a fine balance here. Where do you think that we've made the most progress in being able to do that? I'd say the biggest progress is the consistency of contracts. And so the reason that we're able to do this is because in December, January, February, we were putting anywhere from like 12 to 15 contracts on the board a month. Now, not all of those are going to close. And it gives us the flexibility where some of those are going to be cash that keeps the the wheels churning, like you were saying, to allow us the opportunity to do something else. If we were where we were a year or two ago, where it's maybe we're getting two, three, four contracts, and if one of those is in a cash deal and they're all novations, we have 20 to 30 grand coming in. And now you're struggling with everything else. Totally. So the two problems that I see are people that are always looking for the quick buck. And then because of their living situation, they're spending at or above their means at all times. So they can never set themselves up for success to do bigger deals because their bank account's always running dry. So they always have to wholesale and they're always looking for that quick buck. That's one end of the spectrum. The other end of the spectrum is what I did where I'm extremely frugal. I hate paying taxes. I'm an intense saver. And so I went and bought a bunch of rental properties with all of my reserves. And I bought too many. I bought too many. So I was equity rich and cash poor. And so now I'm in the same situation as somebody that's spending up to their means because I don't have the cash flow coming in to be able to make the marketing budget and pay payroll and all these things to run a business, right? And so I think it's like that's 
one of the biggest lessons that I learned. Having cash reserves doesn't mean you're just sitting on cash doing nothing. And that was my perception. We had a lot of conversations about that. Yes. About like, I don't would... want to have 300 k in the yeah. bank. Why would you do that? That's so stupid. Yeah. What if it... I could make 50 grand on this flip? Exactly. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to increase my net worth by 100 k if I buy this off-market deal. I'd be stupid not to do it. 100%. And you just don't. A lot of business is like you don't know what you don't know and paying down the ignorance debt. I think there's two things going on. You underestimate the amount of opportunities that you have to say no to when you're in a cash poor position. You underestimate that until you see it and it happens to you. And when you get better at sales, just like you said, and you get more contracts, you just have more opportunities and you just have more. It gives you more leverage to say no to to the quick buck, right? Because you have more deals coming in. So you're like, I can always wholesale one. We have more opportunities coming in. So bringing it back to this chart that we're talking about, $390,000 month in May, 135 of which came from contracts inked in December. How much from January? 96,000. Okay. So we're talking over (laughs) right there. I mean, you're what, 240,000 of that? Over half. Sometimes I can do math. But yeah, over half of that came from stuff that was in December and January. Yeah, five months ago. And then you, you see things taper off a little bit. Now I'll go to the other, other extreme. How much do we actually have for May? It was one JV deal at $6,000 that we oh. inked and closed that month. <laughs> so That's it, horrible. It, that is really bad. Going back to what we were talking about, though, if that's the only thing you have, right? Are we making payroll? No. no. Are we spending money on marketing? No. So there's an ebb and flow to that for sure. Right. It's not that we only did 6000 in May. It's that... We didn't close any contract that we inked in May. We did not also close in May. It may have moved to June. Right. They're going to close in June, July, and August. But this mm-hmm. is why we say there's a lagging effect to all this stuff. And so you have to be prepared as a business owner to withstand all this and to have cash in the bank to be able to maximize the profit amount on every deal. So let's go into the how and why. We have been completely revamping our lead generation process it feels like the last six months (laughs) so both on adding inbound channels trying new inbound channels and then almost doing a complete 180 with our cold calling and texting so it feels like let's jump quickly to the transition that we've made in our lead generation process and our marketing channels because it feels like we've made a lot of changes in the last six months so on the inbound side we've not only been trying new channels but we've been increasing our spend across the board on a lot of inbound channels. Conversely, on outbound channels, we were generating a crap load of leads. And so we noticed about 60 days ago, this statistic uh, that Salesforce measures for us has been progressively getting worse in our dashboard. We were not even contacting about a third of our leads, third of our outbound leads within 48 hours of them coming into our system. That's a lot. For us, that's like 30 to 40 leads a week that we were just not contacting, right? Mm -hmm. So what did we do? Wow, we are overflowing the system with leads. We need to improve a little bit on quality, and we need to tighten the criteria of what our definition of a lead is to make sure that we have a more manageable amount of lead flow and hopefully a higher quality. Yes. So can you kind of talk me through, like, what are we seeing now that we made that change, did we go too far? Yeah, we probably went too far. Okay. Um, and so to talk about why we did that again, it's that we were seeing about our past metrics where there was like one out of 12 leads that came in the system, converted over to an appointment. That's a lot of extra churn, a lot of follow-up, a lot of additional calls, a lot of time that we're paying lead managers for just to not get in contact with people. And then sometimes when we did, we just found out that they actually really had no interest at all in selling. And so they probably were just not a true net lead. And so we tightened that criteria down to say, okay, we have to dig a little deeper with our virtual assistants. And what that the impact of that on a month-over-month basis is about a 70% reduction in the number of outbound leads that we had. Okay. So pretty massive. So let's give the listeners and viewers some actual numbers and data so they know what it was like before change and after change. So I'm looking at outbound lead to appointments. How many outbound leads did it take in April before we made the change 
to give us one appointment? 12. 12 leads to equal one appointment. Yeah. Okay. And in May, after we made the change, how many leads? It was five. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So how about we made that change? How many total appointments did we have in April before we made the change from outbound leads? We set 34 appointments from outbound leads generated in April. And then in May, we set 26. Okay. So isn't that interesting? We were going for quality, mm -hmm. but we set eight less appointments. Mm -hmm. Huh. So what does that tell us? Yeah, it tells us that we didn't generate enough leads to talk to enough people. Right. Okay. And the interesting part about that, though, is how many outbound leads did we generate in April total? It was over 400. What, 413? Is that what it was? Yeah. And then in May? It was like 123. Okay, so like 25%. Yeah. So we had like a 75% reduction yeah. in leads generated, yet only about a 30% appointment or 20% appointment reduction. Yes. So we did get better at quality, Much right? Much better at quality. Okay. The purpose of why I'm going through these numbers, where is that sweet spot? It's in between the two probably. And so the next question for us is what do we do next? And so... It was, okay, let's look and see what the change does. We expected that because we were going to be able to have a higher quality lead and we we're still going to be able to produce what we thought was enough, we would schedule equal, if not more, appointments because there was less churn. What is churn for the Just listeners? In, in, in this case, like calling through people who are unmotivated, Okay. which inherently, if, if you're the person doing that or if your team is doing that, it sucks, right? Talking to more people that just say, go get lost, doesn't inherently mean that we're going to actually schedule more appointments because sometimes it can lead to fatigue and sometimes you actually kind of give up on like we've seen our folks like get discour discouraged during the day and then it leads to lower activity levels right they burn out they because burn they're out, like yeah. oh i've talked to all i'm doing is talking to unmotivated leads Salespeople are salespeople, right they're finicky they only want to talk to the highly most motivated people they don't want to waste their time Right? How often do we hear this from our mm. sales team? Oh, the leads suck, right? Mm -hmm. No, no, it's just a numbers game, mm -hmm. right? So, And so what we're doing now with, with the changes is like, okay, well, we like the change in getting more qualified leads. We saw that it did decrease our number of appointments. Well, now that means we probably need to ramp up the number of leads while trying to maintain that quality. And so how do we do so? Well, we can do so through increasing our amount of outbound marketing. And so that's what we're looking at next, which is let's we already increased the number of outbound, outbound texts we're going to be sending, and we're going to be looking at getting new lists, better data quality. And then we're also going to be looking at bringing on more virtual assistants to do that outbound work. Okay. So we don't need to necessarily go back to our old definition of a lead, mm -hmm. which was if somebody raises their hand, hey, I might be looking to sell. Mm -hmm. We don't necessarily need to go that far. But if we open the top end of the funnel and just put more people through the funnel and keep maybe a slightly stricter mm -hmm. criteria for what a lead is, we will get more leads, right? Yeah, absolutely. And so, more qualified leads. Yeah. So, I mean, but we, the numbers we talked about before, what were we eight appointments off yeah. from what we had the prior month? And we were five appointments to a lead. So we're only 40 leads away from being able to, and we were at 123. We bumped that up to 160. All of a sudden, we hit our appointment target. We get that to 200. Now we're scheduling more appointments and we're still producing half as many leads as we did two months ago. And that's like where we're, where we're working towards is, great, let's get it back to the 200 mark. We're going to schedule more appointments. They're going to be higher quality, and we'll convert more contracts. Dude, five, <laughs> five leads per appointment on outbound is crazy low. Yeah, yeah it's a 20%, right? Like, so now let's pivot to inbound because mm -hmm. on inbound, we're at, at three yeah. I mean, so, so our outbound. Even, and, that, and that's like a rounding area. So like we, we convert what what 37% of our inbound leads this quarter have converted over to an appointment. So it's almost four out of 10. Right. So like <laughs> in no way should our number of outbound leads to appointment be the same as inbound lead to appointment. No, inbound no. leads, are mm -hmm. they're, ra they're seeking us out. They're raising their hands saying, please help mm -hmm. me with the situation. I need to sell my property at a discount or they're responding to your marketing that's saying mm -hmm. that. The fact that those are close absolutely tells me we're either overqualifying and or just 
not putting enough people through the top end of the funnel, right? Yeah, because, I mean, you look at the other way. We were under 10% two months ago. Yeah. I think it should be at least two to one. I think it should be about 10 to one and four to one or three to one, roughly. So, yeah, so so we need to make some adjustments, and that this is all just part of the game. That's it. It's just part of the game. You You... You turn a knob and see what the impact was and then change it back a little bit. So we are three leads to appointments, or I guess in your case, that's a rounding error. So about four leads to an appointment, or no, is it three leads to an appointment for inbound? Like two and a half, yeah. Okay, it's two and a half leads to an appointment for inbound. Yeah. How about the total number of inbound leads converted to appointments from April and May? I actually don't have that graph in front of me. Would you mind helping me out there? So we set... 32 appointments from inbound leads in April and 28 in May. So pretty pretty close, which makes sense. We didn't really change much on the inbound side. Our biggest change was in March, we tripled our inbound lead budget and we had 47. So that was significantly higher than April and May, which is a little weird. Our total number of inbound leads in March looks like it was 95. Then in April, it was 86. Uh, then in May, it was 82. So not too far off there. That That's pretty consistent. Any other comments on inbound leads or our inbound channels? Yeah, and we talked about this a bit yesterday. Part of the reason that we've been doing a decent job of converting inbound leads is because we trained a lot on it and we put the systems and processes in place. When we first brought on inbound leads, we didn't have the people or the processes in place to be successful there. And so... If you're a solopreneur, you can absolutely do it. You can also get yourself into a world of trouble. If you're paying $300 for a lead, all of a sudden you get three, 10 leads in the door in a matter of a week. You're three grand in, and now you're trying to say, well, what do I do next? And then you go for the next week, and you're six grand in. Oh, boy, I just had 20 leads. I know one of them's going to convert. Which one? I don't know. I don't think <laughs> – most people don't sit there and say, what do I do next? Most people are like – I don't have any more money. I'm out of money. I got to pull the plug. Stop button. Yeah. And as it's really nerve wracking. Mm-hmm. We see this all the time, right? Of like to truly give and measure any inbound channel a chance, you have to give it six months. That's what I think. Now, there are exceptions to that, right? Like mm-hmm. if you're only getting spam or whatever in your channels, obviously I'm talking about replicatable proven channels that mm-hmm. other people in the industry are using to measure it. Yeah. And I mean, let's just look at it from um, industry wide. If you are getting less than like a dozen leads or even 20 leads from any source and you're saying it doesn't work, you just haven't talked to enough people. Yes. And so that like realistically, unless your your inbound cost per lead is pretty low, like 50, 75 bucks, that's going to cost you a lot of money before you actually convert one. And you might get lucky and it might be the first. Or maybe it's the 15th lead that comes in and you have no idea. Yeah. And, and I think too, like our team has leveled up skill wise mm-hmm. significantly to be able to get here. Just one of our acquisitions reps of that 390, just one of the, our acquisitions reps accounted for 211 of that mm-hmm. himself. Mm-hmm. So half. Yeah. He's also our longest tenured salesperson. Go figure. Mm-hmm. Right. He's got experience. He's, calm he's got confidence now he's been through all the failure of the first six months or a year of this but now he can produce a million dollars or more on his own every year for the company think about that one hire yep one good salesperson can make you over a million dollars every single year just one imagine if you can clone that person the potential and you can't put it lightly that it that it just comes from like, oh, great, hire someone. And then all of a sudden that's there. No, let's talk about the failures. Yeah. How many people have we had to hire, fire, get kicked in the nuts, payroll for that probably never should have been brought on? How many? Mm-hmm. Uh, we're, we're probably close to two dozen at this point. Two dozen? Yeah. Okay. What is our success rate? This is a vulnerable moment. What's our hiring success rate been since we started really scaling about a year ago or a year and a half ago? If we're to look at people who've made it past like six months, we've got one person on the team. Wow. That's made it past six months. That sales rep. That sales rep, yeah. Everybody else has either, it's not, they failed in one way or another, or they realized it just wasn't for them, or it was too hard. 
And this is part of like what we talk about now that I wasn't doing a year and a half ago in the recruiting process, which is like, this is going to suck. This is going to be really hard. What have you done that's really hard? You're going to fail. You're going to get told no. Okay, not just no. You're going to get told like you're a worthless piece of shit who is slimy. And that's going to happen. And you have to let that roll off your back. Yeah. What are you going to do? I think there's a mindset shift, at least for me, when I started treating hiring and interviews like its own lead generation process like we would with sellers, Mm -hmm. that's when it really clicked for me of like, oh, I do need to interview hundreds of people to find an A player. Now there's ways to shortcut that, Mm -hmm. referrals, social media, those are your like inbound hiring channels, right? Mm -hmm. Those are more qualified people. Obviously those are the best, but I don't know any company out there that can rely purely on referrals in order to meet their sales needs, right? So you have to go on offense. You have to go on LinkedIn Recruiter. You have to get a wise hire account. You have to be messaging people and talking to people and have hiring KPIs. You just have to talk to more people. Yeah, I would say the only the only time you could see yourself in that scenario is if you're a big enough company with enough brand that people know who you are and then you're not looking to significantly grow. Outside of that, yeah. You yeah. have to, I mean, it's just, it is lead generation and it's silly of us that we didn't expect it to be that way. Speaking of growth, I think if you're just starting to hire a salesperson or beyond a virtual assistant, right? Your first like American based person or even a second or third, the lens that we look through, the one thing that we ask ourselves that really helps qualify whether this is a right person for the role or not is is this person looking to grow? What do I mean by that? Yeah, and that's a cultural thing. Right. Right. And so it depends on who you are. Like if you don't want that, like you're probably not going to be very successful to begin with. Um, but you're looking for somebody who wants to improve themselves. Like what action are they taking outside of just applying for your role? Are they listening to podcasts? Are they reading books? Are they attending conferences? What are they curious about? And if they don't have like a na- – and it really comes back to curiosity. If they're not naturally curious and trying to improve themselves, they're probably not going to be curious with your sellers. And good luck trying to get a person who's not curious about other humans to be able to relate to them. Yeah, and I, I think the danger is too with your first few sales hires, it's very easy to be seduced by somebody that's like, I can close a bunch of deals. I'm a closer. Ooh. Who did who did we get? Who did we get? I'm gonna trigger you. <laughs> who did we get on the phone the other day? A candidate mm-hmm. that basically said, like, "What did he say?" Oh yeah, like, I I got on, and the first thing he said is, "I'm a little confused about this interview." And so, to talk about our, our our hiring process for just a second. We generally do like an introduction call, like yeah. here's a little bit about the role, yeah. and then the next one is a group interview that's a role play interview, and we just role play through a cold call script because it's the most basic thing we could do. Because I have no idea what people's experience level is. So it's how do we continue a conversation? Here's what an introduction call sounds like. And he goes, I'm a little confused. I'm a closer. And I saw the interview was for cold calling. I don't do cold calling. All I do is close. (laughs) And I was like, uh, okay. (laughs) So the, the funny thing, the funny part is I know what he means. But, you, like, you can't have one without the other. You can't be a good closer unless you're good at cold calling. You can't. Yeah. Right? And, so and, basically what he's saying is I'm not willing to do anything except close because I'm better than that. Right? And, if listen, if you're a mature organization and a mature company and you have every single person in the exact right seat, and everybody's only doing their highest and best value. Sure, you can have a pure closer and all they do is close. And if there's no appointments on the board for them, they just sit there with their arms crossed and don't do anything, right? But how many organizations actually exist like that? Because what he's really saying is, I'm too good for that. You just need to put stuff on my calendar and I'll close them. And that's the culture that you're going to create then or bring in the poison that you're going to bring in into your culture of accountability into the organization. Because then you're going to say, hey, David, I don't remember what his name is. Hey, David, um, your numbers this month are down. 
How come? Well, you guys didn't schedule enough appointments for me. Oh, so you're not in control of your own KPIs or targets at all. It's somebody else's responsibility to make sure you hit your targets. What? That's the issue. But I can see a lot of people that start out, they get really seduced by this aura of confidence or overconfidence by other people, and they just they don't understand the cost. They have to learn the hard way. At OfferNow Idaho, we're looking to hire A players to run our organization and help us grow our business. Corey, why would somebody want to work with OfferNow Idaho? Do you want to be challenged? Do you want to grow? Do you want to have people in your culture push you to be the best version of yourself? I do. And that's why I'm here. And in addition to that, do you want to have the chance at growing long-term generational wealth? That's all a possibility with a company that's small, cares about you, and wants you to be able to invest in real estate. What's something that separates OfferNow Idaho from any other real estate company? It's really rare to find a company that can help you get into a home. Sure, they might throw a few thousand into a 401k that you can access when you're 65. How many people are going to help you either provide a rental property or a shelter over your own head? Through our off-market home buying program, we assist our employees in buying properties once they've achieved certain levels within the company. And that's really unique to people because you get that asset. You get to do whatever you want with it. And you're buying an off-market discounted property to improve the quality of your life and your family's life. Yeah, not only that, we offer benefits and we have a very challenging and high growth energy startup feel to our work environment. So we are looking for people that want to make over six figures a year. Right now we have a $3,000 referral program. If you know somebody that's looking for a new role, we will pay you $3,000 once that person is hired by us and they hit their 90 day mark. So if you know of anybody that's looking for a new job or looking to change their life, shoot me a DM at real Ryan Weimer on Instagram. Let's get it. And it very much comes back to where you're at in your company, right? When we had just acquisition agents who also did all their own pipeline management, like that was the discussion. It was like, hey, we don't have anybody to set appointments for you. You're going to have to drum up your own leads. We'll get the data. You have to sift through it. You're going to have to find the people, put them on the calendar, and then go close them. And if that's the size of organization you're at, that is what's required. If somebody can do that and then progress to where like all they're so, so, so good – which we don't have anyone like this yet, and there's other organizations that do, you're so good that it would not make sense for the organization to have you do anything else but that. Then you move into that position. Right. However, <laughs> to then take it one step further where he goes, I'm like, well, we can at least go through the cold call, like role play to see how this conversation goes. And he, and he goes, there you go again with the cold calling stuff. I just told you it's just a waste of my time. At which point, that's a that's the end of the interview. I, I just was really tempted to say some harsh things, and I said, you know what? I just don't think we're going to be a good cultural fit. Yeah. And then you and end the call. It. And then yeah. we ended the call. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because if somebody has that much ego, they're just – it's going to be really hard. They're a cancer. Yeah. And, yeah. and so we, we talk about hiring humble, hungry, and smart. Mm -hmm. He doesn't pass the first one. You have to be humble to be coachable. If you're not coachable, good luck getting better. That's the curiosity piece. Yeah. So as someone that – let's talk about our more of our struggles in how many people we've had to hire and fire and let down, right? One of the biggest things that we did in the past six months to really help us get more tenure, get less churn, and have people stick around for longer is creating a clear, defined promotion ladder for them. Mm -hmm. In order to get this raise or to get to acquisition manager or senior acquisition manager, you have to have closed this many deals or generated this amount of revenue for the company, or maybe it's both, right? Those ladders for promotion give people a very clear black and white guidance on this is exactly what I need to do to progress into my career. And if they have a growth mindset, what they're going to love that because it's very clear and defined. It's not subjective at all. Yeah, and that's in stark contrast to where we said, hey, we're hiring you as a lead manager. All right, now go do the shit work. Call all these people, get all the no's, and just keep doing it and keep doing it and keep doing it. And so they look at that, and they're three months in. They haven't closed a deal, or they're three months in, have closed two deals, haven't seen a paycheck yet. And they say, what am I doing? What am I progressing towards? What's the goal? 
And I think the big thing there is not only is it from like, can we progress lead managers, but we can turn them into acquisition managers, or we have a ladder to then go to dispositions. Or if you're an acquisition manager, there is, there's, you might already be meeting with people, but now you can progress in your compensation. Well, that's sexy. Now I can make more money if I do better. Now, if I do better in a quarter, I get a kicker or I get a, a accelerator. And so those things give people little mini targets. When you get the, the daily rejection, you can look at it on a smaller time horizon because a year is a tough time for most people to look at any goal. Let's talk about compensation real quick. Yeah. This is the thing that people don't like to talk about for whatever reason because it's taboo. Don't talk about it. The- <laughs> <laughs> Salespeople, hopefully, in your organization are financially driven. For us, we want people that want to make over six figures a year, right? The compensation model that you choose for your business, for your salespeople, is the biggest lever that you can pull and it carries the most weight. Mm -hmm. Would you agree? Absolutely. Okay. And so with the sales acceleration formula. Yes. So let's talk about different ways that we've adjusted compensation over the last couple of years because just like when you're a small business turning into a bigger business for scaling, compensation changes because you have to be able to align your budgets to make sure that there's money left for marketing, m- money left to for operational expenses and everything else to make sure everybody gets paid, right? So it's going to change over time, which is okay. And it will change in the future. And it'll change in the future again. And this is not the right model for everyone at their stage in the business. Exactly. Thank you for that disclaimer. So what some people do is they just do a flat percentage across the board. Hey, if this deal closes, it doesn't matter how the deal was closed. It doesn't matter the marketing channel, if it was inbound or outbound, they just get, let's call it 10% of the deal, Mm -hmm. right? There are some that offer a different percentage based on whether it's an inbound or outbound channel, right? So they Mm -hmm. pay more for an outbound channel because it's a cheaper cost per lead. So they pay them a higher percentage of the deal profit from an outbound lead. Assuming it's more work. Assuming it's more work, and which it is. You have to meet with more sellers mm-hmm. to get that contract, right? Mm-hmm. And then a smaller percentage with from an inbound lead because it's more expensive and they have to meet with less people to convert that. What else? What are some other ways to do it? Yeah. Um, there's compensation models that do base structures plus smaller commissions, some that are only commissions, some that are W-2, some that are 1099, each has their own advantage. So what happened when we were commission only? So when we were commission only, we really struggled to retain people because the people we brought in had come from faster sal- selling cycles. Mm. And and the, the, the time lag that we talked about earlier, the January contracts that convert in May, most people don't have enough reserves to make it four months without getting a paycheck. Especially if you're a little older, maybe you have a family, maybe you've got a spouse who's saying, what are you doing? Yeah. You were used to selling cars. Every car you sold, you got a paycheck, and that came in every week. And I could depend on that. I can't depend on you anymore. Ooh, that one hurts. Yeah. So I'm glad you brought this up because that's exactly in our intro call now. Before Mm -hmm. we even do any kind of behavioral or sales type of interview, we say exactly that. Hey, this job isn't for anybody. There's a lot of upside. There's mm-hmm. unlimited upside. There's no ceiling on how much you can earn. But but our sales cycle is longer. And so if you're used to selling a car, cars or any kind of product and then immediately getting that reflected on your next paycheck, those tend to be the people that struggle in this role because it's hard for them to deal with these cycles of uncertainty and not knowing. So the way that we bridge the gap changing from that is now we do a draw hybrid. Can you explain what that draw is? Yeah, sure. So um, what we do right now is we offer a small base. So it's $1,000 a paycheck paid every other week, so $26,000 a year equivalent. Right? That's not a lot. However, depending on your life situation, that can be maybe enough to get you by if you're younger or don't have a family. And if you're a little older, what we say is we understand that people have other obligations. And if in two months' time, which you're probably not going to close a deal in two, three, four, maybe five months before you start to see money coming back in that's significant, if you can't make your mortgage payment, how desperate and needy are you going to be every time you meet with a seller? 
mm. incredibly. Your sales breath is going to be so stanky. What? <laughs> what is sales breath? It's basically like I need this yeah. coming out, and you can tell when somebody needs something. Here, take this cash offer. I, you need to. Like you're in a bad situation, push, sell push, to me. Push, yes, push. push, 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 push. All you're doing is creating friction and sales yeah. resistance. You're not going to get any deals doing that. And so what we've transitioned to is we said, great, we're going to give you some base, that's some security. And then if you need more on top of that because of your life structure, we're not going to offer you whatever you want because that makes it basically just a salary. But within some reason, we can come up on that number. And that, in addition, whatever over $1,000 per paycheck you're going to get is going to be a draw. It's going to be an advance on your future commissions. So you go out and close two deals, that might be the amount of commission that is paying back what you've already been paid. Once you get back to zero, then you start getting bigger paychecks. Yeah. So Is that a structure that would work for you? Yep. So just to re-explain that one more time, the draw is just advanced commissions. Yes. Right? You're borrowing against your future commissions. Yes. That's all it is. Yeah. And Ryan, if you're a business owner, isn't that a risk? What if you don't? What if they don't work out? Yeah, I mean, this is an in, it's an investment, right? Just like when you pay for coaching, mentorship, a marketing channel, hiring people and is, is an investment. And it's usually six months or sometimes a year before you reap the rewards of that investment, right? Mm -hmm. And you start getting paid more than you've paid out. Like mm -hmm. that's just how business works mm -hmm. with everything. And so why we view it in a different lens with people is because there's emotion tied up with it, right? And people management and people problems that people don't like dealing with. If I invest money into a marketing channel or the stock market or whatever, it doesn't call me at eight o'clock at night and talk to me about all their problems in their life or what's going on, right? That's very true. And that does happen, <laughs> that does happen. Yes, so the draw is the way we bridge the gap. Um, let's talk about uh, retainment bonuses. Mm. So let's say we've got, uh, an A player on our team and competition is heating up out there. The labor market is like at any moment they could be poached from a medical sales department or I don't know, company or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. A retainment bonus is something at the end of the year that we can give somebody to say, hey, we really value you. And I wouldn't do this for everybody, but if you're in a situation where like you can't afford it, and it's like a thank you, we care about you to your top A player performers, it's a way to keep them around. And this is the whole reason that big corporations do things with golden handcuffs, right? You give incentives that vest over time and those increase over time because you're hoping that that incentive is there as the carrot people chase for staying around longer. Yes. And so it's, it's, it's another means of doing that. And it has to be a carrot in the future because the same token, right? If somebody's already thinking about leaving and then you just hand them $10,000, that's not going to change their mind. Yeah. They have to perceive that there is a loss. Yes. For, lo for leaving. Yeah. The one, the last lever that I have written down here in compensation are accelerators. So this is something that you can do to either on a deal size basis, let's say your goal for the company is to do a, a 30,000 average deal size, right? Mm -hmm. Well, anything over like a $50,000 deal size, maybe instead of 10% commission on that, they get 12%, right? Mm -hmm. that there's little tweaks like that that the, can incentivize them to get bigger deals, mm -hmm. right? They get paid more the bigger the deal is. Also, you can do it on like a quarterly basis or a semi-annual or annual basis. Hey, if you close... If you generate this amount of revenue for the company in the quarter, anything over that is at an accelerated commission split. So if you make $300,000 in a quarter, right, we're going to give you now 5% more per deal or per dollar over that mark, right? Yeah, it's the way that we've viewed it now, which is like, what is the behavior we're trying to incentivize? Yes. So last month we ran a bonus two and a half percent additional commission if you got a cash deal that could close within 30 days. And what did it result in? It, it resulted in two or three additional contracts that probably would have gone to a novation, except they held the line really tight. And one of those is actually going to be a great deal because they didn't want it to go novation and they wanted it to be cash and they knew we couldn't. It was in, a, in an area that was a little outside of our target, Boise, Meridian, like Treasure Valley. It was out in Ontario, Oregon. 
And he kept the line tight and got a great deal on it, so much so that we said, okay, well, I guess we're just going to close on this ourselves and then relist it. Yep. Yep. So the final thing we'll mention is sales contests, mm. right? So we run these mini contests, whether it's an appointment setting contest, mm -hmm. and then we give out an Amazon gift card or a gift card to their favorite restaurant for the winning mm -hmm. team, mm -hmm. right? Or we have individual mini sales contests, like you just mentioned of, hey, anything that's a, a three week close or less, a cash contract, a cash price, which means they got it at the biggest discount, we're giving an added kicker for everything in this month on mm -hmm. your commission. And these little bursts of fun things help change up the the day-to-day -day just monotony of it all, right? And get people excited and spring people into doing extra action. Yeah, and that was um, one thing from, again, the sales acceleration formula is they said like team-based are usually a better advantage for the company than anything individual-based because you're trying to promote a cohesive culture that excels together. Uh, so we're, I mean, we're going to be doing some more over the next couple of months. Um, our first one we did for an appointment setting goal, and we did it where we were struggling with appointment cancellation rate. And so we said, for every appointment you set, because we're trying to increase the number of appointments, you get 10 points. Every time it's canceled, you lose eight of that. Mm. And so that way it's, are you doing the appropriate follow-up? Are you doing the behavior that we're trying to incentivize? Scheduling appointments, doing follow-up, making sure they're confirmed. And then at the end of that, I think it was like a $100 gift card to the restaurant of your choice whatever that was and people were jazzed about that like Absolutely. is that a huge thing from a company to spend a hundred dollars we spent 300 on a lead no <laughs> so it's not but but the perception of like i get to go take my family out i get to go have a good date experience that i wouldn't have otherwise done for myself is really valuable absolutely i lied there's one more thing i want to mention yesterday how many appointments did we set in one day nine what did we do yesterday morning as a team yeah, so we did a call-a-thon. What's a call-a-thon? Yeah, so if you ever picture the Brady Bunch where you've got like nine cameras, so we're, again, virtual team. If you're in person, this is going to feel like maybe more of a day-to-day -day thing, but it's a sprint. It's we pick two hours on a calendar on a Wednesday morning, hump day morning, and we all get on the same Zoom, and they're required to stay on camera unless they're going to the bathroom or something, and all you're doing is calling, and we set it up as a little team game. Where it's like, how many appointments can you schedule? How many contacts can you get? And then we always throw a fun word in. Like it was meow this time. <laughs> <laughs> so whoever, so, and you give out praise, right? For yeah. whoever says meow in the most amount of calls. Yeah. The most amount of calls. Do they uh, have to say it like meow? <laughs> or do... I, I should have gone back to edit that to see. Yeah. I mean, we've done other like fun, like, uh, like lollipop or like other like fun. I think shenanigans was a word one time. Yeah. Again, all it is, is changing up the monotony and the reason, and, and, just to bring back your point, we scheduled one appointment during that two-hour period. We got all the no's out of the way, and then we scheduled eight more the rest of the day. When the prior day, I think we were at three total. Have you ever had a woken up really early and gone to the gym, and then the rest of the day you're just exponentially more productive because you had such a good workout? Yes. That's exactly the same thing, right? Because you're feeling good, you're energized. We're all in this. We're all failing together. We're working mm -hmm. as a team, right? So even though we only scheduled one appointment, it's that thing of like, we did hard. We went right for hard first thing in the morning. Mm -hmm. So the rest of the day is easy after that, mm -hmm. right? Cool. Well, that wraps up that.